Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Lori Roffelson, R.D. Lori Roffelson is a registered dietitian at Washington Hospital Healthcare System. Lori completed her studies at San Francisco State University. She is a prominent speaker for Washington Hospital's community outreach educational programs. So, you know, heart disease isn't something you just wake up with one day. It is something that progresses and develops over over a lifetime and and talking about children and childhood obesity um, it's never too young to adopt and try to follow heart healthy guidelines so even for children um, the recommendations we're going to talk about today would be uh, important to to encourage because it is those habits that we develop in younger years that usually we can continue as we get older Sometimes it's harder to change our habits as we get older and more set in our ways or set into certain eating patterns. So let's talk first about what constitutes heart healthy diet or heart healthy living. Um, it can be a lot of little things that we do every day. Maybe if you're stopping by the coffee shop and instead of choosing whole milk, you choose low fat or fat free milk in your coffee or if you leave off the whipped cream, uh, or you're at the sandwich shop and you choose the sandwich off the lower calorie menu there, um, walking the stairs at work. Those are some of the little things we can do day to day that do add up. And it can also be some big things that we choose to do. For example, quitting smoking would be, a, 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 I would consider a big thing. Uh, giving up that daily donut for breakfast and it, substituting it with maybe a bowl of oatmeal and fruit. Losing 10 to 15 pounds can be a significant change, can really uh, improve blood pressure and cholesterol levels. Um, so just keep in mind, a lot of little things and big things will add up over a lifetime to help promote healthy aging as we get older. So I just want to share some heart disease facts. In spite of all the medicines and information we have about heart disease, it is still the leading cause of death for both men and women in the United States. And in 2008, uh, heart disease caused about 25% of deaths, so almost one in every four in the United States. And more than half were men, uh, but women are in that group too. And what a good thing we know, though, is for people with heart disease, studies have shown that if you lower your cholesterol and blood, blood pressure levels, uh, you can reduce the risk of dying from heart disease, having a non-fatal heart attack, or needing uh, bypass surgery or angioplasty. And for people who don't have heart disease, lowering your cholesterol and blood pressure levels can reduce the risk of developing heart disease over a lifetime. So let's talk about what are the things that in our diet and lifestyle that influence our heart disease risk. So these are some of the things we can change. We can't affect, we can't change our genes, we can't change our age, can't change if we're a man or a woman. There's certain things we don't have control over, but we do have control over maybe things that affect our blood pressure which can be influenced by high sodium diet, um, high intake of unhealthy fats. And we're gonna get into talking about saturated fats and trans fats and what they are. 
high intake of dietary cholesterol, um, oxidative stress, being overweight, having a lack of exercise and activity. And if we have diabetes, if it's not controlled well, so that these are all things that we can have an impact on. Let's talk first about blood pressure uh, and sodium control in our diet. Uh, so normal blood pressure numbers are systolic less than 120 and diastolic less than 80. And if you're in a pre-hypertensive range, it's 120 to 139 over 80 to 89. And so if you're in that range, that's kind of a warning sign. You need to start making some changes to bring down your blood pressure. And then if you're in the hypertension range, uh, stage one and stage two, you can see where the numbers are. And, um, and that at that point, you do need to take some action with probably medication and combination of medication and diet. What we know about sodium is, and how it affects blood pressure is that, and, and this is true definitely in the United States where we have a high sodium intake. Uh, as sodium intake increases, so does our blood pressure. And conversely, studies have shown if we, uh, with consistent decreases in sodium intake, so does blood pressure decrease. So what is sodium in the diet? It is an essential nutrient, but we generally need it in very small amounts. Unless you're an athlete who sweats and loses a lot of sodium in their, in their sweat, um, we don't need, there's, there's plenty from dietary sources that we don't need to, we, we really need to control and reduce more than anything. Uh, primarily we get sodium in the form of salt in the diet, which is sodium chloride. And salt is added to foods as a preservative. Uh, at, it cures meats. Uh, it's used in baking. It masks off flavors. Um, it's used to help retain moisture and enhance flavors of foods. In the American diet, 75% of our sodium comes from processed foods. And that would include canned foods, frozen foods, uh, packaged, boxed, uh, instant pasta mixes and rice mixes, those kind of things, but also breads, um, baked goods, snack foods, those are all considered processed foods. So actually the salt we might add at the table or in cooking is a pretty small proportion of the sodium in our diet. The majority really comes from all those processed foods and when we eat out, that's where we're getting a lot of our sodium. So there's some new recommendations for sodium intake. Um, Americans consume about an average of 3,500 milligrams a day. And current recommendations suggest try to reduce to less than 2,300 milligrams per day. But if you are in a higher risk category, let's say you already have heart disease, you've had a heart attack, um, you should further reduce intake to less than 1,500 milligrams a day. Um, so if you're in that higher risk group, if you're older than 51, if you're African American, if you have hypertension or diabetes or, excuse me, chronic kidney disease, all of those are indicators to try to lower your sodium intake further. Now, 1,500 milligrams is very low. And it is doable on a very, uh, you know, it's a, it's a diet that does not include processed foods at all. You have to be eating a lot of fruits, vegetables, home-cooked food. And for, really, for most Americans to achieve that lower level, food manufacturers have to start decreasing the amount of sodium that they're putting in foods that we buy. Because otherwise it's, it's not gonna be doable for most Americans. So let me give you some overall diet and lifestyle strategies to help control and lower blood pressure. Regular exercise and activity is one. Uh, and Dietary Guidelines 2010 from the USDA recommend that adults 
try to aim for at least 150 minutes per week. That's about two hours, 30 minutes of exercise. And you can divide it up any way that you want to. It could be, you know, 20 minutes a day. It could be, you know, if it works for you to do it all in just two days a week, you can do it that way, whatever works for you. And moderate intensity is, is the type of exercise you should aim for, which would include brisk walking, bicycling, uh, swimming, you could do dancing, all of those things would, would be moderate intensity. Um, also try to maintain, if you're at a healthy weight now, maintain that weight, try not to gain any more weight. And if you need to lose a little bit of weight, try to do that gradually. That would also help improve blood pressure. Uh, limiting alcohol consumption can be helpful. And of course, reduce sodium intake. So how do we reduce sodium? So I'll give you some, some tips here. Uh, reduce sodium from processed food sources. Of course, eating out is a big one. We can't control often what restaurants are putting in the food. If you go to a place where you can make choices or requests, that's great because then you can, can maybe reduce the sodium there. Um, if you're grocery shopping, of course, try to avoid cured meats. If you buy canned vegetables and soups, look for the lower sodium varieties. I see more and more reduced sodium options as far as canned vegetables, canned beans, because we're always trying to encourage people to eat more beans, they're good for you, but the canned ones do have sodium added. So um, you can also remove some of that sodium if you rinse the vegetables or rinse the beans before you cook them. So it won't take it all away, but it will remove and reduce the sodium. Um, try to limit or pick good options when you're looking at frozen foods, um, limit the packaged convenience foods, or compare so when you're looking at food labels, if you're looking at two different crackers, compare the sodium, compare the fat, and choose the one that's a better option overall. When you're cooking at home, try to reduce the amount of salt you use in cooking. And keep in mind, salt you add, or the sodium that's in fish sauces, soy sauce, oyster sauces, all of that also is gonna increase the sodium. And again, try if, especially if you eat out regularly, try to follow these habits when you eat out. If you eat out very occasionally, and it's a special occasion, it's probably not as important to, to be real strict, but if it's a, a regular habit to eat out, then try to also eat heart healthy when you're, when you're out. Uh, at the end of the lecture, I'm gonna give you a website that goes into detail about the DASH eating plan. And the DASH study, or DASH diet study, looked at blood pressure reductions when they reduced sodium. And that's how they came up with the numbers uh, 20, under 2,300 milligrams, because they, they did see blood pressure reduce when they followed the DASH eating plan, and the sodium level was around 2,300 milligrams. But then they also had a group of people in the study who followed closer to the 1,500 milligrams of sodium plus the eating plan, and they, they had even more blood pressure reduction. And so uh, this, this eating plan has been shown to really be, um, it, it is effective at lowering blood pressure if you follow it uh, regularly and um, routinely, and also watch your intake of sodium. So the emphasis of the DASH eating plan is foods that are rich sources of calcium, magnesium, and potassium, which are minerals that help with excretion of excess sodium. So you, they actually help kind of lower blood pressure by reducing sodium um, in the body. And this eating plan encourages whole grains, vegetables, fruits, um, low fat or non-fat dairy products, nuts and seeds and beans. Um, these are all good sources of potassium and magnesium and calcium. At the same time, the, the meal plan recommends reducing sodium, watching your intake of fats, added sugars, which we're gonna talk about a little later, and sweets. So I'll give you the website, which kind of goes 
more into detail about the servings from each group for the DASH plan. Now let's talk a little bit about cholesterol. Since that is one of those labs that your doctor will measure and keep track of over time, how many of you know your cholesterol number, total cholesterol? Okay, only a few of you. Well, you've got to keep, keep, keep on top of that number. Well, we're gonna, we look at total cholesterol and also the fractions of cholesterol, or what we call the good and the bad cholesterol, so we're gonna talk about that. Well, cholesterol in the body has important functions. It's a wax-like substance that the liver makes, and it's found in cell membrane structure. It's needed by the body to make <coughs> bile acids, uh, hormones and steroids, and the active form of vitamin D and it also insulates nerve cells. So we do need a small amount of cholesterol in the body. It's when we have excess circulating cholesterol that it can contribute to heart disease um, and atherosclerosis. So what affects our cholesterol levels? What makes it go up too high? Um, diet can have an impact, weight. So when you're overweight, your cholesterol level can be higher. If a physical activity, if you're not an active person, your cholesterol level can be higher. Um, age, so as we get older, our cholesterol level kind of starts creeping up in some people. For women, when we hit um, menopause, it tends to go up also. Uh, and heredity, so some of us, higher cholesterol levels tend to kind of run in the family. So all of those can, can be uh, things that affect our cholesterol. So I mentioned there's good, what we call good and bad cholesterol. Our HDL level is the healthy cholesterol because its job, it transport cholesterol away from the heart and takes it to the liver and the liver uh, breaks it down. So when you have high levels of HDL, it's actually a, a negative risk factor for heart disease. So desirable is an HDL above 60. When people have low HDL, it's believed some of the causes can be smoking, obesity, and inactivity, uh, trans fat intake, which I'm going to talk about, um, and if you have high triglyceride levels. And then LDL, which is the, the lousy cholesterol number, it carries cholesterol towards the heart and its arteries. So it when you have high LDL numbers, you're more likely to be your higher risk for deposits of cholesterol in the arteries and um, heart disease over time. And so doctors pay attention to that LDL number, especially if you have other risk factors and want to bring it down. And your LDL goal may be less than 100, or your doctor may have an even lower number depending on all your risk factors. When LDL circulates, it can get oxidized and changed, and it can damage the cell lining of arteries. And what are things that can oxidize or uh, change the LDL cholesterol? Well, smoking can, diabetes, low antioxidant intake, low HDL, uh, if you have hypertension or high triglycerides. So all of those things can impact LDL. So we want to keep LDL as low as possible. And there's a lot of you know, cholesterol-lowering drugs that can do it, and there's some dietary things you can also do that can help lower it. So there's foods we know will raise your, specifically raise LDL cholesterol. And that would be saturated fat, that's the biggest culprit, trans fat, and to a lesser degree, dietary cholesterol. So we really want to focus on limiting trans fats in the diet. Um, I'm sorry, saturated fats in the diet. We're going to talk about trans fats next. Um, saturated fats are found in meat, poultry. Um, higher fat meats are higher t uh, typically in saturated fat. Solid fats like lard, butter um, are also sources of saturated fat. Seafood has uh, a little bit of saturated fat in it, but what we like about seafood is it's lower in saturated fat compared to like red meat and even chicken. 
when you look at dairy products, if they're whole fat or full fat choices, they're going to be higher in saturated fat uh, than the fat free or the low fat options. So we always encourage choosing the low fat dairy products. And then there's some plant foods that also have uh, saturated fat, coconut, coconut oil, palm oil, and palm kernel oil. And you see palm oil and palm kernel oil used a lot in packaged processed baked goods, like sometimes in cookies and crackers. So I try to avoid when I'm shopping, if I see palm oil or palm kernel oil, I, you know, I try to you know, look for another option because I try to avoid those. Another type of fat that can raise your LDL cholesterol is trans fat. And we still see trans fats in baked goods and processed in the, in the manufacturing industry, but I think they are being used less, but you, you'll still see them on packaging. Trans fats are created by the partial hydrogenation of liquid oils. So it takes a, they take a liquid vegetable oil, hydrogenate it to make it a solid, more stable fat to use in manufacturing. So it extends the shelf life, it doesn't go rancid as quickly, and so they were used widely in cookies and baked goods um, for a long time until we realized that they contribute to heart disease just like saturated fat. So they raise LDL cholesterol, and they can also decrease your HDL level. So they kind of have a double whammy in a bad way. So we want to avoid trans fats. Um, there's no recommended level that's acceptable. We just want to, you know, you're just supposed to avoid them as much as possible. So you'll see on food labels, it might say hydrogenated vegetable oil or partially hydrogenated. Uh, look for that under the ingredients because under, on the nutrition label, it may say trans fats zero. So it may, it may have zero grams, but it may have less than a gram in the product and they can say that it has zero. So also look under the ingredients to see what type of oil or fat they're using in that product. Um, so you'll, you'll, you'll probably spot hydrogenated oils in commercially baked cookies, um, crackers, uh, pastries, those kind of things. If you eat out fried foods, often they use a solid shortening for their fryers. So if you go to like a donut shop or fried chicken type of place, it may be a hydrogenated oil they use unless you ask them or unless they advertise, you know, we use um, trans fat free oil. Like we in our cafeteria, we use a liquid trans fat free oil for our, for our cooking. Um, also, if you buy solid stick margarine or vegetable shortening, like a Crisco type of product, those also um, are hydrogenated. So tips to avoid trans fat, read your food labels, uh, limit or avoid eating out fried foods if you're not sure what type of oil they're using. At home, use natural unhydrogenated oils. And if you're looking at packaged foods, try to choose those that are made with liquid oils and avoid hydrogenated fats and saturated fats. Um, for a you know, spread that you want to buy for toast and things like that at home or for your vegetable, go for the soft tub margarines that um, the first ingredient is water or liquid vegetable oil. Um, those, a lot of those are have no hydrogenated fats in them. Those are a better option than butter, which is very high in saturated fat. I get that question sometimes, what's better, butter or margarine? Well, some, there are some margarines that are a good choice uh, and better choice than butter. Now, if you're trying to also limit cholesterol, because to a lesser degree, dietary cholesterol can also raise your, your total cholesterol number in the blood, um, remember, cholesterol is only in foods of animal origin. So if it, was, if it had a mama, then it has cholesterol in it. Um, so foods that are very high in cholesterol include egg yolks and organ meats. And just remember, there's no cholesterol in plants and uh, fruits and vegetables and those types of foods. 
So let's talk a little bit about fats because the Heart, American Heart Association, their, their recommendations have changed over time. The recommendation used to be a very low fat diet, but the emphasis more is now on what type of fat we're including and not that it has to be low fat, it just has to be the right types of fat. So think quality, eat the best kinds of fats for your heart, and also keep in mind quantity because all fats have a lot of calories, so you have to you know, keep your weight in a healthy range while including fats in the diet. Now one of the sheets I gave you in the back is a comparison chart, a comparison chart of different dietary fats, different oils and uh, fats that are out there on the market. Um, the ones that have the higher percentage of, of the yellow are higher in monounsaturated fat. Um, canola and olive oil kind of rank at the top. And those would be the ones you want to emphasize for the most part, monounsaturated, and also the, the ones that are more with the blue line, the polyunsaturated fats. And eat less of the, um, so you can see even canola at the top, it's a small percent saturated fat, but the majority of it is uh, monounsaturated fat. And so you want to choose oils that are primarily liquid and mostly monounsaturated or polyunsaturated and really reduce the amount of saturated fats. So why are the good fats so good? Well, our monounsaturated fats do not raise your LDL cholesterol and they don't hurt your HDL level. So, so that's the good thing about monounsaturated fats. The polyunsaturated fats also do not raise your LDL cholesterol, although some earlier studies suggest a high intake of polyunsaturated fats may decrease your HDL, but more recent, um, re more recent recommendations don't say that that's necessarily going to happen. Uh, and then we have our omega-3 fats, which are shown to, to decrease inflammation risk for sudden death and heart arrhythmias among people who had prior heart, um, heart attacks. So there is an emphasis also on including omega-3 fats and those sources, uh, food sources on a regular basis for heart health. So we have the EPA and DHA omega-3 fats. Those are found in fish and marine life. And then we have the alpha linolenic, which is the plant version, and those are found in green leafy vegetables, flaxseed, canola oil, soybeans, uh, English and black walnuts, and wheat germ oil. If you eat the plant versions, the body has to convert, convert the alpha linolenic to EPA in the body. And so the studies that show the omega-3 fats having some protection for the heart were done with the, the fish oils, not with the plant oils. So I think they're still doing studies with the, the, the plant omega-3s to see if they have the same benefits for the heart as the fish oils. So there's really more evidence now that the fish oils have that heart protection. But it's still recommended eating both. So the American Heart Association says for the general public, Try to eat at least two fish meals per week, preferably oily fish. Um, eat a variety of fish, so you kind of spread your risk because there are environmental pollutants. Uh, if you go to the FDA.gov website, they list fish that are lower in methylmercury and environmental pollutants that you can include on a more regular basis. Uh, and still also include those plant sources of the omega-3s. If you have documented coronary heart disease, the American Heart Association suggests consume at least one gram a day of the EPA and DHA, preferably from oily fish, but talk to your doctor if maybe a supplement would be right for you. And then for high triglycerides, higher doses of the EPA and DHA have been shown to help lower triglyceride levels, but that would be under physician's um, care and um, monitoring if you take high levels of those fish oils. 
So, you know, we, we talk about percents, like percent calories from fat. Uh, so our, our heart healthy recommendations, I think sometimes um, can be confusing because you want to translate that to, well, how much fat is that per day that I can, I can consume? So I kind of broke it down by calorie level. And for someone who, let's say a, a, a woman probably can eat about 1,500 calories a day, maybe a little bit more if she's very active. And if she maintains the recommended 25 to 35% of her calories from fat, that would allow her about 42 to 58 grams of fat per day. And for heart healthy guidelines, keeping the amount or percent of calories from saturated fat to less than 7% would allow her about 10 grams a day of saturated fat. So to, to, to get to those low levels of saturated fat, you have to be eating lean cuts of meat, avoiding um, a lot of fat from dairy products, not eating a lot of cheese, eating your vegetables and fruits, not eating a lot of fried foods, etc. cetera. Uh, and then you just wanna keep your, your you know, exposure to trans fats as low as possible at any level. Um, most men would probably be around 2,000 calories a day, maybe a little bit less if you're trying to lose weight. And that, so you can see the range of fat and saturated fat that that gives you at that calorie range. And then if you're a very active person, you could have maybe more like 2,500 calories. And so as your calorie you know, needs go up, your percent of, of fat that you're allowed goes up a little bit too. So if you're already trying to follow heart healthy guidelines and you still wanna get your cholesterol level down more, or you want to see what else you can do to uh, improve your um, intake of fruits and vegetables, what you might want to check out is the TLC diet, which is through the National Cholesterol Education Program. And TLC, TLC stands for Therapeutic Lifestyle Changes Diet, which shows that with specific Additions and changes to the diet, you can reduce your LDL um, cholesterol level even more. So aspects of TLC include having a reduced intake of saturated fats, which we've already talked about, uh, enhancing LDL lowering by increasing soluble fiber, and studies show a certain amount that is, is effective at helping lower your um, cholesterol level more, which is 10 to 25 grams a day, adding plant stannels, I'll explain what those are, uh, reducing weight, and increasing physical activity. So these are all the aspects of TLC that are um, encouraged to help lower your cholesterol more. Um, the TLC diet, it basically follows a heart healthy or American Heart Association recommendations as far as the amount of fat in the diet. Um, they give some specifics for fiber, trying to aim for 20 to 30 grams a day of fiber. Um, it's a little tighter on recommended cholesterol, and that's because this, is, this would be the, the diet we send patients home with in the hospital if they've had maybe coronary um, artery bypass surgery if they've had a heart attack, and so they need something a little bit tighter than the American Heart Association guidelines that are for the general public. And so the cholesterol recommendation is a little bit lower, um, but the fat and the other um, numbers are about the same, along the same lines as American Heart Association. So to translate all those numbers to servings of food, because I think that's a little bit easier to sort of visualize, having no more than five ounces a day of meat or fish or chicken, and that's to limit your saturated fat. If you have dairy products, they should be fat-free or low fat, two to three servings a day. If you have eggs, two or fewer per week, and again, this is for people with heart disease 
or, or high cholesterol levels, and they're trying to reduce. Uh, fats and oils, focus on the heart healthy oils that you include, and the amount depends on your, your, your calorie needs and what your weight goals are. And breads and cereals, around six or more servings per day. Again, it depends on your, your calorie goals and your activity level and your size. You know, a woman or a smaller person would eat probably six or fewer. Um, a, a person who's more active or bigger would, would have more than six servings per day. And then lots of fruits and vegetables. So five to nine servings a day of fruits and vegetables, which provide fiber, energy, uh, antioxidants, um, and not a lot of calories compared to other foods. What uh, the TLC diet is able to do is reduce, by making any one of those changes, um, reduce LDL cholesterol. Um, overall, if you were able to do all these changes, um, you might see a reduction of 20 to 30 percent if you could implement all the recommendations of TLC. Everyone is going to probably respond a little differently to the diet, but that's the, the potential is there. So let's talk about one of their recommendations is adding more what they call viscous or soluble fiber. Think of soluble fiber as the sponge that's in your intestine. It's helping absorb all that dietary cholesterol that is in the gut. So before it's absorbed, that, that um, soluble fiber is there to help sop it up. So some good sources of soluble fiber in the diet include barley, oats, psyllium, ground flaxseed. If you eat flaxseed whole, the seeds are not digested. It's not going to give you that uh, soluble fiber benefit. And then fruits that are good sources include apples, bananas, berries, citrus like oranges, nectarines, peaches, pears, plums, and prunes. Uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots are all good sources, as well as beans and soy products. So these are all great sources of soluble fiber. Uh, plant sterols and plant stanols, you might see this on food labels in stores. They naturally occur in many food, and they're also added kind of as a supplement to foods because they do have some cholesterol-lowering effect. They have a similar structure to cholesterol, so they help block absorption of dietary cholesterol when they're consumed in the diet. Um, they help lower your LDL cholesterol without affecting your HDL cholesterol. And the level that the NCEP recommends is about 2,000 milligrams a day. That's a therapeutic level that can help lower cholesterol. Um, I'm listing here some of the food sources, but to get that high level, you probably need to take a food from the store that has it fortified in it. Um, and some of these, like Benicol, Take Control Margarine, uh, Minute Maid, HeartWise, Orange Juice, it's been added to yogurts, uh, breads, and cereals. Some of these products come and go, I think, depending on popularity and if they're, you know, if people are buying them or not. But you will, you know, if you next time you're at the store, you might notice on a yogurt or something it says, you know, plant stanols for cholesterol lowering. Or now then you'll know what what those are added for because they do have some effect on cholesterol lowering. Now, if you are also shopping and just want some, you know, a quick, a quick symbol that tells you that product is approved by the American Heart Association, you can look for that little heart with the check. And that means it meets these, uh, this criteria by the American Heart Association, that the total fat is less than three grams, uh, has less, one gram or less of saturated fat, it's uh, less than half a gram of trans fat, 20 milligrams or less of cholesterol, and the 480 milligrams sodium or less per serving. So it can be a, you know, basically can fit into most people's heart healthy guidelines. Some other tips for shopping, uh, you know, always read nutrition labels on packages and compare. 
Um, choose foods that don't have a lot of added ingredients, such as salt, fats, or sugar. It's a little bit easier to figure out what's in there, too, if the label doesn't have too many, too many complicated ingredients. Um, in general, try to choose foods that have less than 300 milligrams of sodium per serving. Um, and if you're looking for fiber in foods, try to choose cereals that have at least 5 grams fiber per serving and breads that have at least 2 grams fiber per serving. And this uh, website I listed at the bottom, that is through the American Heart Association. It has website. It's a website It gives shopping, cooking tips, as well as um, some recipes. So if you want a little bit more information, you can go there. Now, one of the, at the beginning of the talk, one of the risk factors for heart disease I mentioned was diabetes, and if it's uncontrolled. Um, so the diabetes and heart disease connection is, um, as diabetes, uh, blood sugar levels increase, um, you know, diabetes, just having diabetes increases your blood sugar levels, your blood pressure, um, your blood lipids can go up, your cholesterol and triglycerides, and it can increase inflammation in the body. And so all of these changes increase your risk for heart disease. And 65% of deaths among people with diabetes are due to a heart disease uh, or stroke. And so heart disease death rates are two to four times higher among people who have diabetes. So we, we definitely have to consider that. When we have someone with diabetes, we have to look at also their, you know, do, do they also follow a heart healthy diet? Uh, I just wanted to give you the blood sugar goals. For someone who is going home maybe after surgery, because uh, Dr. Wax is going to be in later, he's going to talk about surgery. Usually a more stringent blood sugar goal is desired um, just to help with the healing process after surgery. But for, for most people, these are the blood sugar goals, fasting or before a meal, that the American Diabetes Association recommends. So 70 to 130 before eating or fasting first thing in the morning. And if you check one to two hours after eating, your blood sugar should be about 180 or less. And again, a little bit tighter control would be about 140 or less uh, two hours after the beginning of the meal. And your doctor may have different blood sugar goals for you. Um, these, are, these are just recommended by two organizations, but um, we also have to individualize sometimes. So I mentioned one of the things that can be elevated when you have diabetes is triglyceride levels. And that's another, uh, that could be part of the lipid panel your doctor does on a regular basis. It's a, a storage form of fat in the body. Um, it's produced by the liver. And sometimes our triglyceride levels can be high when we're overweight, uh, if we are physically inactive, if we, excuse me, if we smoke cigarettes, drink excess amounts of alcohol, or have a high carbohydrate diet. And so there are some new recommendations through the American Heart Association looking at intake of um, added sugars. So there, there's a link, they believe, through uh, increased added sugars and uh, increased levels of blood pressure, increased triglyceride levels, increased fasting glucose, decreased insulin sensitivity, uh, increased abdominal fat weight gain, so specifically those that have a higher level of added sugar intake maybe are you know, putting that extra weight around their abdomen, um, which raises your risk for heart disease, uh, and also increased inflammation and oxidative stress. So all of those things um, can raise your risk for heart disease. So now they have some added sugar recommendations from the Heart Association, which you think usually they're just talking about fats and cholesterol, and now they're getting into sugars as well. So they recommend for, for the adult woman trying to limit your added sugars 
to about 80 calories per day, or about five teaspoons. So really keeping an eye on calories from sweets, sugar drinks, sugar in your coffee, any, anything that is considered added sugar. They're not talking about sugar from natural fruit uh, or the natural sugar that's in carbohydrates and other foods. For adult men, men always get to have a little bit more, so they're allowed up to maybe 144 calories per day from added sugars. So this is just something to think about when you are choosing, if you're, if you're one to eat dessert every day, maybe try to cut back, not have as many sweets or added sugars. Um, over time, it can definitely, again, this is one of those little things that you do that maybe will be good for your heart. So for reference, one 12 ounce cola, if you have one cola a day, that has eight teaspoons of added sugar or 130 calories. So if you're a big soda drinker, just that alone can be adding quite a bit of, of calories from added sugars. Now I want to include a couple slides on pr foods. This is kind of an emerging topic, but I found it interesting. There's some foods they consider pro-inflammatory to the body. and these include excessive consumption of refined sugars, since we're talking about sugars, uh, from candy, pastries, sugar-sweetened beverages, highly processed carbohydrates, donuts and potato chips. Uh, certain types of oils are hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated fats, or trans fats. Processed meats, like hot dogs, lunch meat, sausage, and saturated fats. So these are all believed to increase inflammation in the body, which we know can also be a contributor to heart disease. Oh, there's trans fats at the bottom. Now, I have to give you, of course, foods to include which are considered anti-inflammatory. So these I want you to, to try to include. Uh, beans, legumes, which includes peas and lentils, tofu, uh, beverages like green tea and red wine. Now, wine and alcohol is not right for everybody, depending on meds you're on, so you have to you know, talk to your doctor if, if you're not sure if you can include that. Um, certain fish, like cod, halibut, herring, and oysters. Fruits, um, I would say include you know, just fruits in general, but these in particular are considered anti-inflammatory. Apples, berries, cherries citrus, pineapple, tomato. Uh, these herbs, if you include basil in your cooking, cinnamon, ginger, mint, oregano, and thyme. Uh, nuts. Nuts have a lot of health benefits, and they are cons they, they're mainly monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. So they make a good snack uh, and, and very you know, satisfying just by the unsalted and eat you know small handful of them. Um, oils like canola and extra virgin olive oil. Dark chocolate again in you know little amounts. Some studies that looked at, at chocolate you know they they were giving participants in the study like an ounce you know not a, not a lot of chocolate but you can buy them packaged that way in small amounts. And then these vegetables bell pepper, broccoli, cabbage, garlic, greens, onions, sweet potatoes. These are all considered anti-inflammatory. So to kind of summarize, these are from the American Heart Association. So recommendations for cardiovascular disease risk reduction. Balance your calories in and physical activity to help you maintain or achieve a healthy body weight. Consume a diet that's rich in vegetables and fruits. Include those anti-inflammatory ones. Choose whole grain, high fiber foods for their cholesterol lowering benefit and also the, the B vitamins and antioxidants they have. Ch uh, consume fish at least twice a week. Uh, limit your intake of those the unhealthy fats, the saturated fats and trans fats and cholesterol to 300 milligrams per day. Uh, less than 200 milligrams per, per day for individuals with heart disease. And you can do this by choosing lean meats, 
uh, and vegetable alternatives. So I didn't talk much about, uh, you know, maybe substituting a meat meal once or twice a week with a vegetarian meal. That's a great way to lower your, your overall saturated fat intake for the week. Select fat-free and low-fat dairy. Minimize your intake of trans fats. Um, minimize our intake of beverages with added sugars. Uh, choose and prepare foods with little or no salt. And if you consume alcohol, do so in moderation. And try to follow these guidelines when you eat outside of the home, especially if you, again, eat out um, a lot or on a regular basis. So here are the resources I wanted to give you so you can get recipes and get more detail on the DASH diet if you're interested. And that's my talk.